This program is brought to you by thepodcastfactory.com. You are listening to Death, Glory, or Disappointment. Welcome back to another semi-entertainment-based, more information-based episode. Here is your knowledgeable host with the most, <laughs> Mr. Dan <Ken> Meredith. <laughs> Shut up, Stop you laughing, man. You're messing up. <laughs> you keep making me giggle in the introductions, you silly ass. <laughs> What's up, Mr. Meredith? I'm um, good, my friend. So we're going to take a little bit of a uh, departure for the next couple of episodes. So I've been collecting questions on both Facebook and Instagram from some of you lovely folks. And we're going to smash through the ones we've got on Facebook today. And then next episode is going to be the ones we've got from Instagram. Oh, wow. This this should be I haven't done a Q&A for a while. I think, you know, I think maybe once a month we right. should. A once a month Q&A is good. Let's do it, man. So we're doing Q and A on Facebook. So I guess you got the questions there. Let's let's jump in. I'll just sit sit here and take notes. Cool. So first question from Christine Locker: uh, What are your core values, and how do they influence your decisions? So I'd say the two core values I want from my team and from myself are well, loyalty, say through honesty and hard work. They're the three that really do run through, you know, as best as we all can through everything I do. Because if you're, you're not loyal to those that, you know, to your staff, you know, to your mentors, to the people that supported you, you're just a fucking asshole. Um, honesty is important. Like I think we both know, I mean, let's face it, Jonathan, the amount of people we see who've done digital products, only 100 copies. Really? Are yeah. you selling it by the <laughs> fucking pixel? You lying shit. So, you know, being honest with people and the thing is you can you can pull the wool over people's eyes for a while, especially if you're quite smart and creative and a good talker. But quite frankly, it's 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 a value that you you know you you really should should espouse. Um, and hard work. I mean, I I've I've said this multiple times. I, you know, I'm probably like promote the slowest way of achieving anything. You know, it's kind of like get really good at something and then spend two to five years telling people about it and keeping going. It's like, great. It's not exactly a sort of sexy one thing to have on a sales page, is it? So no, no. that's the three. And so realistically, you know, I believe probably now in the position I'm at more working smart, but I am going through a period of hard work. It's something I know I have in my toolkit. And those three areas are kind of my core values. And if it doesn't fit, especially the first two, then we take a pass. So that's that's that question. Okay, next question is from Alan Cheng. So Alan actually came down to see me in Brighton recently. And his question is, how do you prepare slash organize yourself for a productive day at work? Now, I actually slipped off the wagon a couple of months, well, maybe about three or four months ago. And, you know, money was good. Things were coming in. Um, you know, everything was good but I'd forgotten the basics that kind of got me to where I was. So how do I organize? And to be honest, to answer your question, for those period, that period of time, I didn't organize myself. I basically woke up and winged it. So there was no content plan. There was no marketing strategy. It's very much sort of free balling and seeing what happened. So how did that work for you, Dan? It, well, it did actually send me off the rails a little bit because I found myself without any degree of structure. Um, You know, I started eating less healthy, exercising less, injuries came back, started drinking more. Um, Um, Was not, yeah, it was not good. So I find this with a mind like mine, um, complete structure, no, will never, ever, ever work for someone like me. It will do my head in. But a little bit of structure does me the world of good. So how to organize myself is straightforward. So I speak to my project team so Leanne and Tega on a Monday I also speak to my PA so she looks after me personally um, on a Monday as well and I also speak to my boys who run my fitness facilities and do my kind of fitness stuff 
also on a Monday. So separate calls of each of them, just really to get the week set up um, well. I this is do you know I'm even, I feel even stupid even saying this. I'd been struggling. I do now. It's fine to get myself organised. And then I sort of realised, and I looked into the box. I have a box of kind of stuff I use here for like direct mail and lumpy mail. I wrote my own fucking planner to help me get shit done. It's called my I Get Shit Done Planner. And I fucking forgot I had it, which nice. is dumb as piss. <laughs> so, yeah, so there you go. Even the, you know, those of you may, and I say look up to in a, a very tongue in cheek way, but yeah, pretty fucking stupid, to be honest with you. And I was quite embarrassed that I'd forgotten that I didn't even have my own planner using it by my side. So I started writing things down. For those of you who don't have my planner or don't ever wish to have one or use one, write things down. So literally the same, the same things that got me to work, doing a brain dump on a Sunday, ranking what was most important, doing three to five important things per day and letting the rest sort itself out. A lot of delegation, so handing off to people. So not in a lazy, but empowering people to do their job and paying well for that. So having systems in place, knowing that, you know, Tager and Leanne have everything running. I've now got an American project team to handle some of the stuff I'm doing stateside. So that's where I got myself back. But even silly little things like, setting an alarm i haven't set an alarm unless i had to travel you know to like get a flight or something for probably two years jonathan so now i set up an alarm at eight o'clock have a coffee go for a walk usually walk for about 45 minutes to an hour just clear my head listen to music listen to a podcast very much my time don't look at my inbox don't look at my phone i come back do a little bit of reading uh maybe watch a cartoon, so I'm not some American dad, a family guy, or a bit of South Park, you know, just something that entertains me. Rick and Morty, another favorite of mine, even though I've seen them all the time, it just kind of gets me in a good mood. Then I'll journal for a bit. So when I say journal, it's not in a kind of wussy kind of way. I'll literally just spend five, 10 minutes writing out shit that's in my head, what I'm thinking about. Then I go to my planner, see what I have to do that day, and then I strike that shit off. That's it. A little bit okay. of structure, a little bit of simplicity. And, you know, and having an evening routine as well. And one other thing as well, which is done. So I then, at the same journal, sort of do like a big brain vomit, for want of a better word, and just bleh, get it all out onto the page. And it's done, mate. I write my thoughts out at the start of the day, and they clear my head. And this is a new thing I've done. I do, <laughs> okay. The answer to the question, did I need to spend a £1,000 on a brand new iPad just because it had that little pencil thing? The answer is no. But... I wanted it desperately and I worked hard for it. I saved up for it and I put, you know, I do put money aside for sort of little fun treats and it was a treat for me just before my birthday. And what I've done is this is something that's I've stripped it, Jonathan. I've stripped it of everything except entertaining. It's got games on there. It's got Amazon, my Amazon Prime video. It's got Netflix. It's got my, my video, you know, my downloads on my cartoons and stuff. And the last two hours of the day, I put the night filter on, put my orange glasses on and I just chill out. You can't get me no. 10 till 12. <laughs> Off you fuck. Nice. nice. I like it. Cool. So next one. Um, Patricia, what were the things you needed to change you would accept yourself a higher level of income? That's a pretty good question. Because I think, I mean, I, you know, I don't know what your family background is, Jonathan, but mine was fairly humble. Um, Mum and dad, you know, very much made ends meet. And it's not until I look back as an adult, I realized the savings they made. Does that make sense? It's like as a kid, you don't know any different. When you're an adult, you're like, ah, I, can see what, I can see what they did there for us. So I think the first thing was is desensitizing myself. So my mentor told me to go, you know, we did our first ever, you know, multiple six-figure launch. Um, he told me to go and stay in a really nice hotel in LA just for a night, just to experience what it's like. So I kind of desensitized. I went to nicer places, nicer restaurants. Didn't necessarily spend a lot. One of the tips he told me was to go and spend time in like coffee shops of like five star hotels and really nice places because anyone can have a coffee. You can just go and sit there and have a coffee. Anyone can go in, and it helped you kind of desensitize yourself to wealth. And I used to have a real issue with money, as in I fucking hate people who are rich. Always jealous. I was like, so it's easy for them. You know, they were born into it. They're cleverer than me. Went to the right schools and. Then I started spending more time with sort of self-made entrepreneurs and business people and so on and so forth. And they're just like me, mate, normal people. 
So one of the best ways of doing it for me personally was joining masterminds, was going to events with successful people, people who are way more successful than me, and hanging out with them. And I soon realized they were just like me. They were just a little bit further along in the journey. And it really took that kind of negative edge off of my thoughts around money. Don't get me wrong. If you're a rich, toffee-nosed, inherited money motherfucker, you can go choke on a bag of dicks. Like, I'm sorry, you ain't got no fucking stress. You can fuck off. But to everyone else who is fighting the good fight and wanting to make something in themselves, and equally got some friends who come from, you know, wealthier families, but they've decided to go on their own, good on you. Because money is not a bad thing. Money is a good thing. Money gives you options and it gives you freedom. That's it. And before I used to have quite negative connotations. Money is just a thing. It's just some numbers. Unfortunately, those numbers can give you a lot of your time back and it can give you options to do things that maybe you wouldn't. So there's the old joke, isn't there? Money doesn't buy you love. I'm sure you've heard that one before. And I used to joke with my ex-girlfriend. My ex, well, yeah, well, that's a different kind of love. That's more of an hourly rate kind of love. Yeah. Um, anyway, so moving, moving swiftly on from that particular discussion for no reason whatsoever. Um, fuck's sake, Jonathan. Um, sorry, I got the giggles now. <laughs> How did we move on to prostitution? Um, my ex is my ex's mum. She used to say, you know, money doesn't matter as long as you've got your health and your happiness. And I'd be like, yeah, if you try paying a gas bill with love. No, it doesn't off. work like that. But, you know, no, it doesn't, money doesn't buy you happiness, but it does allow you to maybe be available to go to more social events, to travel, to do things that maybe you wouldn't be able to if you had less. So that's kind of how I did it. I just started showing a bit of my thoughts around money as well. Okay. Claire Dowdle, what's been the best and worst days of your business journey so far? And what did you learn from them? Well, best day I just touched upon just then. So that was having you know a multiple six-figure launch. Um, only the second thing I ever did. And it was, you know, the fact is, and I, and I say this to explain, I, I was in LA um, for someone else. And that's when we were doing it, sort of crossed over whilst we were doing it. And I went into... A watch shop and I bought a watch which was has a lot of meaning to me because my father told me when I was 13 if I could ever go into this particular watch shop and buy this particular watch without having to ask for credit um he said you've made it so so my dad will be getting that watch from me at some point soon I'm still enjoying really? it yeah it's, it means a lot to me because that's the watch that basically that's my I made it watch yeah. um stayed in a beautiful hotel in Beverly Hills um, I basically just had two days of being a rock star. It's like someone out of MTV. And honestly, like I said, money, they say, like I said, money doesn't play happiness. Yeah, it really did. For those two days, I was happy as a dog with two days. Um, worst day was um, we had a few issues with uh, basically, you know, first ever time working with a larger group of people, a few bits and you know, the wheels started wobbling on this thing we were doing and it was out of my control. People were you know, kind of unhappy with me. It wasn't, you know, certain deliverables hadn't happened. They did all happen in the end. So I'm pleased to say it all went, all went well, but I was very much unable to control the situation. And the, I, I love making people happy, but the idea of me making someone upset really fucking gets to me. And I was walking along with a friend. I was walking um, there from America. So I was doing a bit of the tourist thing. I was stressed to fuck because I wanted to fix this, but I thought, fuck it. You know, I'll have one day. I'm going to turn my phone off. You know, it's not life or death. It can wait, but I'll fix it. But not today. And I was walking along and I felt my hands getting quite heavy. And I was like, this is weird. Like I had like a 20 pound dumbbell in each hand. I was like, that's strange. And then my arms got heavy. And then my chest got heavy. And I thought, am I having a fucking heart attack? And literally just outside um, Buckingham Palace, I pretty much fell to my knees. And I, I thought that was it. I thought that was me a goner. And uh, fortunately, I went to the hospital, had my heart checked and stuff. And it turned out just to be like, just stress, buddy. Just my body basically saying, you need to chill the fuck out. And ever since then, I've kind of, you know, always made sure I can, you know, do my job to the best of my abilities. But let's face it, Jonathan, I mean, you've had, you'll have had customers, I'll have had customers where just, they're just not happy. And I just don't let it get to me anymore. And I'll do my best to fix their problems, make them happy, do what I have to do. But I, that was the worst day. So generally thinking I was about to die. Yeah, that'll... that'll- Put it down. I will do it. <laughs> okay. 
And we so, maybe one or two more, Dan. Okay. Um, do you know what we're going to do then? We're going to split Facebook into this one and next one because obviously there's lots of great questions here. Um, and I'd rather do that than miss out on a couple if that's all right with you. So Ben Street, the importance of being unique and how it's sometimes the person and not the business that people buy into. How can we utilize our uniqueness in business? That's a good one, wasn't it? Yeah. The thing is, unique is good, but it takes time to figure out, God, this is going to sound very metaphysical, who you are. As in, it's taken me three years of experimentation, of trying different things. Remember, I'm not trying it for the sake of trying it. Like I, I always say there's the inner, inner you and the outer you, and the closer you can get those two together with what you say, what you do, your actions, your feelings, your thoughts, the happier you're going to be. And it takes time and confidence and practice to be able to do that. So, yes, unique is good, but not unique for just the sake of being unique. So the Dan I am now is the Dan I've always wanted to be. But from your question from a business point of view, I often think niching down, specialization, being known for doing one particular thing really well i mean there's a great case in point there's a um a bagel shop in london it is honestly jonathan it's like a it's like a like a, a broom cupboard okay it's tiny like a closet and there's this old couple we've been there forever all they do is salt beef bagels that's all you can get they don't do anything else but they are the best salt beef bagels i've ever had in my life old jewish couple and that's all they do so being, I'd say, known for one thing, being really good at one thing is one way of doing it. But like I said, niching down. I mean, Jonathan, you're the podcast guy. That's what I you am. do. And you do it well. And as we said on a, a couple of episodes ago, you've been doing this since 90, was it 1999 or was it? Like oh, fucking forever. Oh, 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 nine. <laughs> oh, oh, nine. So oh, nine. But still closing on, you know, eight, nine years of solidly doing this and nothing else. So I'd say unique is good but don't like be gimmicky that's what i was trying to get at so don't just be dress wacky be weird do crazy stuff but be you if you're an outgoing lively person then put that into your business put it into your market that's what i do i enjoy it and yeah people do like me for just me and they're kind of like okay how do i one guy messaged me the other day says i don't actually know what you do but i'd like to work with you i was like cool that's awesome yeah and he's a really successful guy like an ex-creative director for olgavi really really successful guy Um, but yeah, if you're not like me or you're not maybe as outgoing, then just become known for being really, really fucking good at your job. That's unique enough. Just, I've mentioned this before, just being good at what you do over and over again and consistently is massively fucking powerful. Like my, um, osteopath I go to, who's put, basically put me back together again a couple of times. He's phenomenal. He's not a natural marketer. He's not an, oh, no, he's a fun person, but he's not the sort of person who do stuff like this. But he gets a lot of business just because he's really fucking good. That in itself is being unique because so many people nowadays are mediocre. They phone it in. They do like the minimum effective dose. What's the least I have to do to get the best result? If you over deliver, if you give phenomenal results, phenomenal service, trust me, you will stand up. Nice. So, Dan, are we going to go ahead and wrap this up and then come I'm back? I'm going to say let's wrap this one up and we'll go to Facebook questions, Q&A part two in our next episode. All right. Coming back at you next week with more Facebook Q&A. This is another death, glory, or disappointment in the can. You've been listening to Death, Glory, or Disappointment with Dan Meredith. If you enjoyed the show and you want more, then your next step is to go to iTunes right now and subscribe. And while you're there, give us a rating and review. It'll help us out a bunch, plus it'll bring you good karma. This is the podcastfactory.com.